you are ready if he should come today. Remember that quote. If your heart is right today, you are ready if he should come today. And that's based on a principle in scripture found in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 that says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And it's a profound thing to think that our thoughts or the things that we spend time reflecting on have enough influence and power to shape who we are. Because you see, your thoughts come out in your actions. And your actions repeated over time become habits. And your habits eventually make up your character. So important with the things that we spend time thinking about that have a profound impact on our life. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you that this time is yours, Father. Speak to us. And we pray for your Holy Spirit, Father. We pray for your Spirit to anoint everyone here, to open our ears to hear and our eyes to see, to hear your voice speaking to us. And we pray you would fill us with the love of Christ. And Father, please put your words in my mouth. Teach me what to say, Lord. For this is your word, not mine. Let my preaching not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And please stand with me and strengthen me so that by me the preaching would be fully known. We ask this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The other day I was with some friends and uh, we were sitting around a table and we were having a conversation and the question came up. What do you think is the greatest need in our church right now? As you can imagine, that probably opens the floor up to a few different answers, but there was a slight pause, and then someone finally broke the pause, and we were all in agreement with what was said. Love. Love is probably the greatest need in the church right now. And I'm sure some of you are maybe familiar with the statement, The most urgent of all our needs is a revival of true godliness. But I would suggest that true godliness and the love of God are the exact same thing. And with the world we're living in right now, (laughs) crazy times, isn't it? It seems that something as simple as a vaccine and everyone's opinion can cause division among a nation. And what's even scary is it's causing division in the church. And it makes you wonder, with the nation and with us as a church, have we lost our mind? Have we forgotten what our purpose is? You see, Jesus' prayer right before he went into the garden was he prayed for unity among his believers. And as I've been to different prayer meetings and had some interaction with different individuals, it seems the one thing everyone's praying for right now is unity among our members. Which implies there's division going on. And the Bible has an answer for how to be unified. In David, in Psalm chapter 133, it's only three verses long. But he says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold it, because it's a wondrous thing. When you see it, pay attention because it doesn't come around often. And how good and how pleasant it is. The fact that David has to say how good, how pleasant, he can't quite compare it to anything. It's not quite measurable by any other standard. It's just beyond those things. It's that good and that pleasant. The unity that he's picturing. And he goes on to say that it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. It went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains 
of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And we will talk about that here in a little bit. But I believe that with division, if we can identify the cause of division, we can also find the cure. And so we need to address the vision, what's causing it, signs of it, and then we can address how to fix it. So go with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as you're turning there, just to give you some background context, the Corinthian church is a church with many issues going on. And one of the first things Paul talks about, or he addresses, is that there's division going on in the church. In chapter 1, verse 10, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Because it has been declared to me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I of Christ. So the church is divided. People are taking sides, and Paul is trying to address this issue. And he goes on through these next few chapters really talking about this in his discourse. And in chapter 2, he's trying to explain to them, listen, I'm, I didn't come to you in the wisdom of men. I didn't come to you with eloquent words and speeches. I didn't try to persuade you through philosophy. I came to you in the wisdom of God. Amen. Because I don't want your faith to be in the wisdom of men. I want it to be in the power of God. Amen. Right? And he goes on in chapter 2, verse 9. He quotes the Old Testament and says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, they the deep things of God. So the very things that we think are uncomprehendable, that we've never thought about, never seen, never heard, Paul is saying we can know those things when God chooses to reveal it to us by His Spirit. Right? And then he goes on using this example by saying, What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? In the same way, you know... Kathy or Dell, nobody knows what they're thinking except them. Right? Nobody knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man that's in him. And spirit's a dynamic word. It can mean wind, it can mean breath, it can mean character, and in this context, it means the mind. Okay? And so he says in the same way, nobody knows what God's thinking except God. Right? And that's why he says, we did not receive the thinking of the world. We did not receive the spirit of the world. We received the spirit of God. But when we came to you, we couldn't talk to you as unto spiritual. Because he says, the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. Because they're foolishness to him. And in verse uh, 16 of chapter 2, he says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. And he says, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And that word instruct means to unite with God. To be of the same opinion as God. To come to the same conclusions as God. So when he says, but we have the mind of Christ, Paul is essentially saying, we are thinking the same way God does. We're on the same page with God. But you, Corinthian church... You're not. And then he goes into chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So what does Paul liken a carnal church to? A what? A child. He says, I, when I came to you, I wanted to talk to you about the things of God, but I couldn't because you're too busy acting like children. 
You know, when I was growing up and I was young, my parents would sometimes have conversations and if I found myself wandering towards them and I wanted to, you know, sit down with them or whatever, my parents had to tell me, you know, you know, honey, why don't you go find your sister and go, go play with her? But mom, why can't I stay here? Because your dad and I are having an adult conversation. It's not meant for children. Right? If they were to let me in on their conversation, not only would I not understand it, it wouldn't be of any benefit to me. And in the same way, God's saying, I want to speak to you spiritual things. I want to let you in on what I'm thinking, but I can't because you're thinking like children. You're acting like children. And if I were to tell you, not only would you not understand it, it would be of no benefit to you. And he talks about how he has fed them with milk and not with meat. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, you don't have to turn there unless you uh, want to, but uh, Paul is talking to the Hebrews about Jesus and his high priestly ministry. And he says in chapter 5, verse 11, of whom, speaking of Christ, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. We want to tell you these mysteries of Christ. We want to explain this truth to you, but it's hard for us to explain it because you can't understand it. You're dull of hearing. For when the time, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Because everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And that word unskillful implies you lack the experience of applying those things in your life. And that's why he says in the next verse, but strong meat belongs to them that are fully mature, a full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They've taken the word of God and they've applied it to their lives. They're skillful in the word of righteousness. So a carnal church is a church that is spiritually immature. They haven't grown up yet. And he goes on back in the 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He describes what a carnal church looks like. In, in uh, chapter 3 verse 3, For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions... Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? All the fighting that goes on in the church, the disagreements at board meeting, the taking sides, you know, I only come to church when so-and-so speaks. This is evidence of a carnal mind going on in the church. And God is saying, you're acting like children. You're spiritually immature. You have, growing, you have some growing up to do. Because Paul goes on to say, who am I? And who is Apollos? You know, I plant Apollos waters, but guess what? It's God who gives the increase. Amen. You know, Cliff might plant, Quentin might water, but guess what? We're not here to play favorites. They're both doing the work of the Lord. We should be all co-laborers together with God. Amen. Souls don't come into the church through one man's preaching. They come in because God brings them in. And we need to understand this, friends. We're getting too caught up with fighting among ourselves and we're forgetting what the mission is to save souls. This shows, friends, that division is rooted in selfishness. If you have division in the church, there's selfishness going on. But even more than that, Paul, in Romans chapter 8, he says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So that means a church that's acting carnally is a sign that the church is dying. But a church that has the Spirit of God is a living church. So a carnal church is actually absent of the Spirit of God. And you might have the Spirit of God on Sabbath. 
But do you have the Spirit of God in the, in the board meeting? Or in the prayer meeting? Or wherever else you are? In your home? In, you know, with your family? Because these principles can apply outside the church into our own lives and our relationships with others. And Paul even goes on to talk about how we are the temple of God and the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell in us. But if we defile the temple of God, we're deserving of damnation because the temple of God is holy. And Jesus said it's not what goes into the man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man. Out of the abundance of the heart, or the mind, the mouth speaks. And you know, Satan loves it when we fight against each other. This is why. Satan delights in war because it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. When you're fighting with each other, with family or with fellow church members, Satan is skipping for joy because he knows you're not getting ready for Christ's coming. <laughs> and actually when there's division in the church, we're at enmity against God, which means we're actually united with Satan. Because if you don't have the spirit of God, by default you have the spirit of Satan. But God doesn't want to leave us in that condition. Throughout the whole Bible, you had unity in the beginning, before sin entered, and then once sin entered, once that selfishness came in, division happened, and we were separated from God. And through the whole Bible story, God has been pursuing you and I so that He can be reconciled to us. And He made that possible through Jesus. Jesus is the repairer of the breach. He wants to repair the breach in your life with Him. And as Paul goes on, he talks about what a spiritually mature Christian looks like. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He talks about in chapter 12 the gifts that are given to the church and that they're for the edifying of the church. The church is to be united as one body. Just as you and I have many different body parts on us, they're all blended together perfectly, they all work together in unison, and that's what the church is supposed to look like. Each member has his own function, okay? If I was to lose my left hand, things would be pretty difficult. Even though I'm right hand dominant, I still need my left hand. It's of great value to, to me. And if you're all here, you're all members of God's church. Don't think that you're not needed. You have value. God wants to use you. You know, uh, Dell, you had mentioned, you know, if you stub your toe. What happens when you stub your toe? How does it affect your walk? Ah, you know, the whole body should be affected when one member is hurting. The whole body should be affected when one member is hurting. So Paul is talking about the greatest gift here in 1 Corinthians 13. And he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I could be the most eloquent speaker you all have ever heard, but if I don't have the unselfish love of Christ, I'm just some obnoxious noise to your ears. He goes on, If I have the gift of prophecy, if I knew from cover to cover, all the mysteries of God in this book. I had the gift of prophecy. I had visions, had all knowledge. And even if I had all faith so it could remove mountains, if I am doing things motivated by selfishness, there's no point in having all that knowledge. It's worthless. He says, and even if I give all I have to help the poor, even if the church gave all it has to help the poor, or even if we offer our life to be burned as a martyr, if it is not motivated by unselfish love, it's completely worthless. 
There's no point in doing it. He says, love suffers long. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. It's not prideful. Love is humble. You know, and as you go through this, substitute your name in for love. You know, can it be said? You know, Chuck, is, does Chuck suffer long? Is he kind? Is he envious? Does he puff himself up? Is he prideful? You know, does, does Quentin behave himself rudely? Does he seek his own? Is he easily provoked? You know, John, can it be said, does he keep track of the things everyone's doing wrong? Do we rejoice in iniquity? Or do we rejoice in the truth? Do we bear all things? Do we believe all things? Do we hope all things? Do we expect the best in others even when it doesn't appear to be there? Do we endure all things? Does our love remain constant towards others even if they depart? God is love. He remains constant even when we have wavered in our walk with Him. Even when we have been selfish. In Paul, down in verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, <laughs> I put away childish things. When I was an unrepentant, unconverted sinner, I lived by selfishness. I lived for myself, but when I grew up, when I became born again, a new creature, and when I put on that new man, I learned what true spiritual maturity looks like. I grew up, I started loving people the way Christ showed me how. That's what we need in the church. That's the, the goodness and the pleasantness that God is looking for. And how Paul addresses this issue of division is back in chapter 1. After he got done saying, you know, some of you say, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos and so on. In verse 13 he says, is Christ divided? He's, he's like, was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? What does he do to start bringing healing in the church from division? He points them to Jesus. You see, a divided church is a church that has lost its focus on Christ. It's lost its focus on Christ. Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 3, he says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Compassion, kindness, humbleness of mind, and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. The perfection of Christian character is the love of Christ in the soul. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul also talks about this, this way to unity. How we achieve unity among our members. In chapter 2, verse 2. He says, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one what? Mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in what? Lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, there was no selfishness found in him. He was completely set on saving you and me. 
making sure that we have an opportunity to, e- to live an eternal life. The, the way to achieve unity is through humility. The way to achieve unity is through humility, denying ourselves. We get upset because we don't get our way, because our idea or our opinion wasn't accepted. And there's this mentality going on in the world, and unfortunately it's in the church too, and the mentality is, I think right, therefore I am right. But there is no truth to that at all. You're not right. Just because you went and read a few articles on the vaccine, now you're the next expert when it comes to the virus. (laughs) Because you watched a few videos on YouTube, now you know everything. (laughs) That doesn't make you right. We hold to our opinions and we try to passively push our opinions on each other. But that's not how Christ showed us how to love each other. Loving someone is saying, you know what, I may disagree with you, but I still respect your opinion. We can show Christ-like love to people and still not necessarily agree with them because unity is not conformity and it's not uniformity. And you know, at the end of time, the world is going to unite. But there's a difference between the unity of the world and the unity of God's people. And it's the motive behind why they're uniting. The world unites out of selfish ambition to get what they want. God's people unite with a motive of unselfishness for the saving of souls and doing God's work. And Paul goes on to describe this mind that's in Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus did not consider being equal with God something to hold on to. He willingly left heaven, gave up equality with God to pursue you. And you know what's interesting? Many of us, our motive for doing God's work is so that we can get our mansion in heaven. Friends, Christ gave up heaven for you. He stepped down from glory for you, implying there is more value in you than there is in heaven itself. Do we place that amount of value on lost souls in our community? Those who don't know Christ? Would you be willing to give up heaven in your eternal life so that someone else has an opportunity to have it? That's the mind of Christ. It says in verse 7, He made Himself of no reputation. He made Himself a nobody. Our Creator, the One who made us, who knew us before we were ever formed in the womb, He came down here, made Himself like you and I, and became a nobody. The King of the universe. And He took upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Have we lost our mind as a church? This is the mindset we need to get back. Because having the mind of Christ, friends, it leads to death. Death of self. It leads to the eradication of selfishness in the heart. How many of you have ever seen a symphony or been to a symphony before? A few of you. You know, it's interesting how there's so, there's so many different instruments, right? But yet, the, what they're all doing is they're all focused on playing one song. And they're all looking to the uh, conductor to keep tempo. They're not looking at the next person saying, oh, why are you three notes behind? You're throwing me off. The conductor's saying, hey, look up here. They'll get back on tempo. They just need to keep looking to me. You're going to get off track if you take your eyes off me. <laughs> and when they're all playing together in unison, when they're all got their eyes fixed on the conductor and they're all focused on playing the song, 
What a beautiful sound it makes. When the church stops looking at each other, stops with all the finger pointing, and looks to Jesus, and we focus on playing the song of the gospel, how beautiful a song that will be. No man is to live unto himself. The Christian is in the world as a representative of Christ for the salvation of other souls. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you are to forget self and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of His goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. Receiving the Spirit of Christ, friends, is the fruits of the Spirit or the character of Christ being produced in your life. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character, your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And then the fruits of the Spirit are listed. And it says that this fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. Now get this. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of Himself in His church. We're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. Friends, we get to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord if we would just get back with the program, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're all who profess His name, bearing fruit to His glory. If everyone was doing the work that they're supposed to be doing instead of looking at each other, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. If the Spirit of Christ was in us as it should be, the work would finish so much faster and we could go home. But it's taking longer because we choose to be selfish. Well, I don't like what we have planned going on. I'm not going to be a part of it. Friends, let's get one thing straight. This is God's work, not our work. He's going to finish it with or without us. But He invites us to be a part of it so we can share in the joy The greatest work that can be done, friends, in our world, even if you have no other work, you don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to be an evangelist, you just be you. And the greatest work that can be accomplished is to glorify God by living the character of Christ. Yeah. Just focus on that. Today, with my neighbor, I'm going to show them the love of Christ. You're doing the Lord's work. You don't have to give them a Bible study of 28 fundamental beliefs. People need to know you love them. Because when you're loving, the Bible says God is love. Amen. But if you can't love your brother or your sister whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Yeah. Don't say you love God and then hate your brother because then you're a liar. And the love of God is not actually in you. Unselfish love. And this is a time when we need to be coming together in prayer, devoting our hearts completely to the work of the Lord. Now what's interesting is in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there was the consecration. Remember in Psalm 133, when David said, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, one of the examples he mentioned was the oil being poured upon Aaron's head. The consecration of Aaron and his sons. Now here's what's interesting. We're not going to read it. But it's in Leviticus chapter 8. And also in Exodus 28 and 29. But I'm going to give you the rundown real quick of 
what the consecration was that took place. They were washed in water, and then the temple and Aaron were anointed at the same time. And that's where David's referring to, the oil on Aaron's head that ran down. And then there were three offerings that were offered, the sin offering, burnt offering, and the wave offering. And then the rest of the priests were sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifices and the oil. And then they were to remain in the temple, carrying out that service for the next seven days. And they couldn't leave the temple until the time of consecration was finished. Oh, I love this book, friends. This is an amazing book. <laughs> I want you to see something interesting here. Just as the priests were washed in water, Jesus was baptized. Just as the temple and Aaron was anointed, Jesus was anointed at his baptism. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And then just as there were offerings... Christ gave himself, his death, burial, and resurrection, all typified in the sacrifices in the consecration service. And then, what happened next, where the priests were sprinkled with the holy oil. Oh, come on. Oh, here. Mm. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples at the day of Pentecost. Amen. And then, Jesus was to re is to remain in heaven until the time of consecration is finished, ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. But even more than that, we are to be cleansed from our sins. And when we are anointed with the Spirit of Christ and have him dwelling in us, manifesting His character, we too are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And just as the priests were sprinkled, we too, through the blood of Christ and His Spirit, are perfected in holiness. And then we are to remain in Christ, or in the temple, in the temple, <laughs> until the time of consecration is over. Friends, you know that Jesus knocks at the door? He wants in. Amen. He wants his mind to be in you. Because he knows if it's not, you will perish. But praise God, we're promised that he not only, he, will, he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. He's doing the work. He's sanctifying us. He's perfecting us in holiness. So true unity in the church will, will be achieved when everyone is filled with the Spirit of Christ, the unselfish love, and everyone is completely consecrated to the Lord's work. Amen. How many of you are looking forward to the latter rain? The latter rain, as we understand it, is when the third angel's message goes forth boldly with power. Boldly. And God is going to use His people who are His humble instruments and who are completely consecrated to His work. And when that happens, He's going to pour out the Spirit and the third angel's message is going to go forth with so much power that God's people are going to be standing up boldly for the word and they're going to be able to even do miracles to combat the miracles of Satan himself. Whew, what a time. But, the great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire, wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by the outpouring of His Spirit without measure. Jesus had the Spirit poured out 
to him without measure when he was upon the earth. Why? Because he was completely consecrated to doing the Lord's will. And if we follow Christ's example, if we can stop looking to self and we say, you know what, Lord, not our will, not my will, but your will be done. Let me simply be the channel through which you love other people. Then God will say, you know what? Here's my spirit. Go forth boldly. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. When the church has become living, working churches, the Holy Spirit will be given in answer to their sincere request. Then the truth of God's word will be regarded with new interest and will be explored as if it were a revelation just from the courts above. Every declaration of inspiration concerning Christ will take hold of the inmost soul of those who love him. Envy, jealousy, evil surmising will stop. The Bible will be regarded as a charter from heaven. Its study will absorb the mind. Its truths will feast the soul. And the promises of God, now repeated as if the soul had never tasted of his love, will then glow upon the altar of the heart and fall in burning words from the lips of the messengers of God. They will then plead with souls with an earnestness that cannot be repulsed. Then the windows of heaven will be opened for the showers of the latter rain. The followers of Christ will be united in love. I love this picture. That's what unity looks like. Everyone looking the same direction Christ is looking. And I believe they're looking at the lost souls in the world. They're not looking at each other. They know who the head is. They know who the head is. And just as your body parts respond to what your mind wants it to do, your body parts are completely surrendered to your mind. And look at all the things you accomplish. Imagine if your hand wasn't surrendered to your mind. Just imagine if the church, if every member was completely surrendered to God, the work that could be accomplished. What a thought. Praise God that he has made a way for us to join him in that work. Praise God that he even chooses people like us to be messengers of his love. <laughs> These are things that angels want to look into. They don't get to experience it like we do, friends. The love of God. Friends, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Friends, I want you to listen to the voice of God speaking to you this morning. Maybe you've been convicted by God. Maybe you acknowledge that you've caused division in the church or division in your home. That you've been selfish when it comes to the things of the Lord. And God wants to invite you to make a decision today. He wants to invite you to make a decision to be completely consecrated to His work. Like the hymn, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. If you only want to be a vessel through which He works through, that others may see His love. I want to invite you to come to the front this morning, if that's your decision. This is an individual decision, friends. Don't be swayed by others. This is between you and the Lord. If you want to be completely consecrated to His will because you're ready to go home, if you want the love of Christ to be seen in you and through you, the forsaking of self,
Praise the Lord. Friends, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here before you with our hearts humbled. Father, we confess our sin. We have been selfish. It's in our nature, Lord. But we're praying, Father, that as we stand here today, you would see that we want to be made willing. That we want to be completely consecrated to your work. And we're asking for your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, your divine nature, to make us spiritually minded, to give us the mind of Christ. Let the burden of souls be upon our heart. Father, we ask your blessing over us. Father, it's our prayer that you would take our life and let it be consecrated only to thee. We are yours, Father. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 You may go back to your seats. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. That was a most amazing message, and it was certainly from the Holy Spirit. Um, speaking of, from the Holy Spirit, the Tullahoma SDA Church this week, it's in your bulletins, and this is an urgent call for revival and reformation, and I'm sure it's something we all need to hear. And it just goes hand in hand with what all Zach's saying. 
but uh, everyone please try to make it. And there's details. It's at 7 o'clock starting tomorrow night through 7th, next Sabbath. Uh, also, everyone, there will be a potluck. Everyone, please join us after. Just go right down to the fellowship hall right now in just a few minutes. And then also, we have our midweek Bible study. Women, oh, it's, it's that's right, because of that. In Tallahoma, of course, it would be. Uh, women's ministry. I missed the first one, the reversing diabetes. I came last Thursday. I still learned so much. And please, if you haven't made the first two, still come. You're going to get a lot out of it. It's very informative. And it's on Thursday night, starting at 6. We have it this Thursday night, next Thursday night. So it's really good. And there's a fall festival scheduled for Sunday, October 31st, 5 till 7. We hope everyone can attend. Kathy Prawl is heading that up if you have any questions. And uh, again, remember, this is live streamed into our church website. You can hear it. You'll be able to get that message again or any of the past for the past few weeks. It's on YouTube, Quentin, Cliff. Thanks for a wonderful Sabbath afternoon. Amen. Okay. Um, Quentin, would you please end with prayer for us? Our, our love and